In our day, there are, are many new alternatives to evangelism. People are experimenting with new ways to get the message of Jesus to those who have never heard. And there's nothing wrong with being flexible. Um, you do need to sometimes be flexible to get the message out to people that have not heard or are not familiar with Jesus Christ or the gospel. However, sincerity and good objectives are not enough to justify some of these new methods. And we must be careful to stay within biblical perimeters. And there is now an extremely prom problematic missiology that has surfaced that is being promoted by some mission organizations, one of which is YWAM and other organizations, and it all comes to a man named Daniel Kukawa and his book, right here, Perpetuated in Righteousness. Now Proverbs 12, 17 says, He who speaks truth declares righteousness, but a false witness deceit. And what you hear tonight, you can decide whether or not Daniel Kukawa is declaring righteousness. Kakawa's claims that the Hawaiians once knew and worshipped the true God accurately. He makes a case for this in his book. He says the one true God of the Hawaiian people is the same good God worshipped by all ancient people. That when the natives traveled from Polynesia and first landed in Hawaii, they brought with them the worship of the true God. It was only uh, later that it got corrupted. And so where did they learn this true knowledge? One of the places, he says, is through the gospel in the stars, through constellation revelation. And so from this, they were able to worship correctly. And it wasn't until foreign gods from Tahiti came in and corrupted their pure worship. Now, Kakao's premise is uh, not that they just had general revelation, but special revelation, which was given to not only the Hawaiian culture, but now, he says, all cultures throughout the world not just the Hebrews. And so he claims that the traces of monotheism is found in practice throughout all the cultures in this world. Even in his new book, which is, which is yet to come out, called Open Up the Ancient Gates, it's posted on their website, it says, by the sheer mass of information in this book, few would still deny that God has placed many witnesses of himself with every tribe, nation, and tongue. So what Kikawa is proposing by his theory is that God did not just give special revelation to the Hebrews through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then Moses, and giving the law, that instead it is spread out throughout all these different cultures, and that the supreme being, God, can be found in all these cultures, which is Yahweh. That there are redeeming qualities put by God in all these cultures, despite any widespread corruption and we can glean the truth from them. And we will see if this is what the Bible actually teaches or not. Now he writes in his book, it is painstakingly documented and footnoted from beginning to end. This is a history book. Well instead, we have looked into it, looking at the primary resources, and we found that he has changed quite a bit of history with a lot of false information and names. Stories are changed to fit his theory. And I would classify his book as more like a fable perpetuating myths. Now the subheading of the book is The Journey of the Hawaiian People from Eden to the Present Time. And again, his main premise in the book is that the Polynesians were ancient monotheistic worshippers. Now two main theories are presented in the book. Two immigrations had occurred. One, he says, from the Tower of Babel. The other, Israelites, on their way to the Promised Land, were departed from there and went east it came all the way to Hawaii. And he actually gives another option, which is from uh, people from Egypt. Now he, he writes, it's not clear when all the Polynesian people left for the Pacific. Some left at the time of the scattering of the Tower of Babel. Others did not separate themselves at this point, but may have been part of the nation of Israel for a time. And so they went out to Hawaii following the stars. His premise, the Hawaiians were called to the Pacific as a group from the tribes of Israel, which were already headed toward the Promised Land. Now the Bible teaches that God himself was leading the Israelites to the Promised Land from Egypt. And Kikau is actually going against the clear revelation of Scripture by saying that he's proposing a group came from the people of Israel and in rebellion from going into the promised land actually came out eastward 
to the islands. Now, he doesn't show any historical facts about their wilderness journey to the Pacific Ocean, but he does insinuate that his theory is historically accurate. And his history of the people and events are mixed, again, with wrong information, sprinkled with choice quotes, that he has lifted out of context from many myths, history, and put together with basically bad Bible interpretation. He writes, it may be the Hawaiian people are descended from these ancient Egyptians. Well, if they're Egyptians, they're not Hebrews. But then he proposes another answer to this, in his Hawaiian-Israel connection, that the Midianites could be the people of Menes who became part of Israel, and that the Hebrew and Polynesian people have a common heritage for a time, are in the genealogies of the Polynesian people. Now, we know for a fact that genealogies only go back about 400 years. And he's saying that he's tracing them from the Tower of Babel, possibly even from Eden, as his cover, the front cover of uh, his book says. Now, I asked Dr. Frutenbaum, who's a renowned Hebrew scholar about all this, and here's what he wrote in response. To claim that the Polynesian peoples may have been part of the nation of Israel for a time is one of the most horrendous assumptions in the book. There's absolutely no truth to this whatsoever. Now, another main premise in his book is that the Hawaiians learned the gospel from the stars. And he says that the serpent actually seduced Nimrod and his priests to use God's story of redemption in the stars for fortune-telling and occult practices. The Bible says nothing of the sort. Where he gets his story is a mystery to me, but not unlike all the other assumptions that he's put in his book, he just adds this. Now, we do know in Genesis 10.10, it says about the beginning of the kingdom, Nimrod's, was Babel, Erech, and Nahad, and Kalnah in the land of Shinar. And in chapter 11, it tells us that all the peoples of the earth gathered together and built this tower, which is called the Ziggurat, which was a worshiping place for the stars and the planets. And so it became what is called astrology and occult arts. And they worship the heavenly bodies called the hosts of heaven. So it is one of the most ancient forms of idolatry and religion. But it was never used for God. Now Daniel Kikau is not the first person to believe that God has put his gospel in the stars. However, his book is the first to integrate this idea with the culture and invent a new view of God giving revelation to mankind throughout history. Now, the Bible speaks of basically two ways of revelation. One is through nature, that's general revelation, which includes the stars and all things that God created. The other source is the Bible itself. The heavens is not some unwritten 67th book of the Bible with a whole plan of redemption in it. Now, he uses Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, as a literal example of God's plans in the stars. But then right after this, he writes, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now, we know the stars only point to God existing. And they're not going to convert anybody. But the law that is written can convert somebody. That's what convicts us in our soul. Now, he writes, God made sure that all the people would remember him by placing the story of his great plan of redemption in the stars. Now, astrology claims to predict the future by charting the stars. It is what's called the occult. Now, Kikawa tries to sanitize a Christian version of this and give it credibility. The gospel in the stars is prophecy, whose source is not God, because God calls this divination. Now, Kikawa writes in Psalm 147, He telleth the number of the stars and calls them all by name. And then he says, these ancient mariners must have known the meaning of the stars and the story that God put, God put in their names. But he ignores that they use them for navigational purposes, not spiritual knowledge of God. And if you read this quote in Psalm 147 in context, it actually says, great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. God never revealed all the names of the stars to us. But a few, they're mentioned in the Bible. In Deuteronomy 18.10, God forbids Israel to pra practice or worship like the other cultures the other nations did. Kikawa ignores the fact that the Bible states not to learn from the sun, moon, and stars as the other nations. 
In Deuteronomy 4.19, it says, Take heed lest you lift up your eyes to heaven when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, and you feel driven to worship them and serve them. We're not to look at these things to get knowledge of God for the mere fact that you can't. He gave us the Bible for that. In fact, in Isaiah 47, 12, God mocks the people, telling them to seek out their counsels from among the astrologers to save, to save them. God calls this sorcery. He never said, look for the true astrologers with the correct knowledge of me. Now, the point that Kakao was trying to make in his book is that the Hawaiians knew God, his son, his plan of sacrifice and resurrection, and he says that they learned this all through the stars. Now, if God had intended the stars to present the gospel, he would have had to arrange them so that they would clearly form the images for men to see. Now, you could look at the stars in Virgo until you're turning green, and they would never look like a woman, nor tell you anything about the Bible account. These visual images of the stars position could not present the gospel. The clearest image the stars offer is the Southern Cross. Can we look at this Southern Cross and actually see it speak of a perfect, sinless Son of God who would in the future die or had already died upon our cross for our sins? No, we can't. No creation image can explain those facts. And even those who believe these kind of things, finding this in the stars, they actually go to the Bible to explain what these images are. So the whole concept is, is moot. Now, in his second edition of his book, he states, the Hebrew meaning for the star Arcturus between the constellation of the Virgin and the Child and beneath the crown connotes the coming Savior. Then he changes this in his fourth edition. For instance, the Hebrew name for the star Arcturus, not Arcturus, is Aish. It says basically the same thing. So if Yikawa claims the name Arcturus or Arcturus is Hebrew for the coming Savior and tries to fit it in the scenario, of God's redemptive plan. Again, I asked Dr. Frutenbaum, a respected Hebrew scholar, what this is all about. He states the word actoris is not a Hebrew word and therefore could hardly connote the coming Savior. This is one, one of the more far-fetched paragraphs in his book. Kakao also claims the star Orion in Hebrew is Kazil, which means strong one or hero. But when I looked this up in the Bible, I actually found it to be a Canaanite city found in Joshua 15. He also makes the assumption that the wise men knew about Jesus' birth by looking at the star. And again, the idea is that it was written in the heavens, the gospel. He says, probably also knew God's story of the coming Redeemer in the stars. Unfortunately, this star happened to move and stood over Jesus' house after he was born. So it hardly can mean what Yukawa assumes. The logical explanation is that the wise men knew the story from the Bible and took the unusual appearance of the star as a sign, not because they knew the gospel and the stars. Again, Dr. Frutenbaum comments, the author makes the assumption that the wise men may have seen a new star or heavenly sign within the constellation Coma, which is supposed to be one of the deacons of Virgo and Virgin. Of course, that is true in Greek astrology, but among the Jews, there was no star or constellation by that name, nor does it appear anywhere in the Hebrew text. We have found over and over again, Kakao's research is filled with mistakes, assumptions like these, that could never pass a close scrutiny of the facts. And he's counting on people that are reading his book not to look that deep into it. Romans 16.25 actually refutes all this. It says that the gospel was a mystery since the world began and is now made known by the prophetic scriptures to all nations. So the differences can't be reconciled. Notice it was kept secret since the world began and now has been manifest by the scriptures. And actually in Colossians 1.25 it says the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations is now disclosed to the saints. So, how could it be written in the stars since the beginning of time if it's being disclosed by the scriptures? Of course, Kikawa's whole theory goes beyond the scripture, which we are told not to do in 1 Corinthians 4.6, not to go beyond what is written. 
Now, God gave us prophecies, but not all at one time, as he claims in the stars, but through history, he slowly revealed himself through the prophets. And he gave us his word to know him. And he says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing from the word of God, not by looking at the stars. This, of course, brings up another problem. The coward does not believe God's specific revelation was only given to Israel, but to many nations from the beginning. Now, he writes in his book, Bear Witness to the Story. And here's what he comes up with from a Maori uh, chant. Eo dwelt within the breathing space of immensity. The universe was in darkness with water everywhere. There was no glimmer of dawn, nor clearness, no light. And he began by saying these words, that he might cease being inactive, darkness becoming a light possessing darkness, and at once light appeared. He relates this to Genesis 1. And uh, unfortunately, similarity in certain points of the story does not mean sameness. Water everywhere in the universe? The Bible doesn't teach this. Darkness becoming a light possessing darkness? Did darkness become light? Genesis 1-2, 1-1 and 1-2 says, the earth and the heavens were created before the light came. So God was already active. No small, no small point to overlook. Hikawa insists on there being a revelation of the Trinity within the Hawaiian god Eo. That includes the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit prior to any missionary coming to Hawaii with the Bible. So the Trinity is traced where the Hawaiians came from other islands in the Pacific. Kakawa calls the mighty Eo the creator of all things, Eo the eternal. Eo is Yahweh, he believes, and that's why they pray to him. And um, he says, at one time the Hawaiians believed and worshipped one God comprised of three equal beings in nature. And then he goes on and says, these three gods were Akani, Ku, and Lono. Notice it's plural. What we believe is that there is one God who's triune in person, not three gods. And he makes this mistake over and over again in everything that he presents. And then he goes on and says these names were probably titles of the one true God, his true name being Eo. Now this is completely speculation considering that Eo is not one of the more well-known gods in Hawaii. And his book is filled with probablys, maybes, and uh, could bees, all coming from what I believe is an overactive imagination. We find, he says, Eo dwells in the uppermost of 12 heavens. As far as I remember reading the Bible, there's only three heavens. So, we have a contrast in biblical revelation. How can Eo be the same God if he's giving a different revelation? To claim the Hawaiians worship God correctly before the gospel arrived seems to go against the plain teaching of the scripture. Now, Kakao is claiming a specific knowledge of a triune God by oral tradition. So this is an admission that he is not getting it from the Bible. He also mentions the many unis worshiped the nine gods for 700 to 900 years. Well, if the many unis had gods, plural, then the fact is they are not monotheistic. Now in this video, which recently came out, The Fingerprints of God in Japan, he quotes the Kojiki of the Shinto religion. These three deities were all deities born alone, not procreated, and hid their persons. So we find they came into existence, and they're deities. Again, not one God. Kikawa has them as gods, plural, not singular. In other words, he's not presenting monotheism, he's presenting what we call tritheism. And he consistently presents this over and over again in everything he teaches. In the Genesis account, he says these three gods, coming from one of the books that he has on the Hawaiian culture, these three gods breathed into uh, its nose, talking about Adam, and it became a living being. Again, three gods. It doesn't seem like he understands the difference between tritheism and triunity, or triune nature of God. One must wonder if Kikawa really understands the triune nature of God, because he continues to say this, for instance, in Genesis 1, he says, in the beginning, God literally, the gods. 
And then in his book, he says of Deuteronomy 6.4, which is the anthem of Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He says it actually should read, Yahweh our Elohim, God's, is one Yahweh. He says in his book, Perpetuating Righteousness, the legends also say that last of all, on the sixth day, the triune God created man in the likeness of Connie. Hence, man is also called Connie. Well, in the Bible, man was named after the dirt that he was made from, Adam, meaning, meaning uh, earth, or red dirt, not after God. Fukawa has to say this because you notice the inconsistencies in the Hawaiian references of man also being called Connie. Therefore, he changes the whole interpretation. Fukawa also quotes Kepolini's tradition, Kepolino's traditions of Hawaiian approved worship of the supreme being and the Trinity, yet he seems to overlook where he writes, Kani Kanaloa on Lono is this great godhead of the forefathers of Hawaii. Now, Kanaloa was included in the beginning, some say, as four. So he later on says in his book, Kani Ku and Lono, but then he has in this, Kanaloa. Well, there's a problem with that because Kanaloa happens to be called the devil. And so it says, and these gods made many gods, the host of gods, men, and things. So we have many gods making other gods, and this is basically what many of the ancient myths are teaching in the many cultures. So what Kikau is saying is Christian teaching is in fact not. We have class one and classes of other gods, gods in plural, this is not monotheism. Now we looked and uh, over the many years at the primary resources that Fukawa quotes. And unfortunately, it does not say often what he says it says in his book. Robert Langdon, in his book, The Lost Caravel, writes, the first European to learn about Io was C.O. Davis, a government interpreter and Maori linguist. And he says, the only detailed account of Io is that contained in a manuscript dictated by a Maori named T. Mataharanga, taken down by another T. Wadahoro. And this appears in 1913 in the book, The Lore of the Ware Onaga. Langdon writes, the noted part Maori scholar, Peter Bach, was among those who found the EO cult impossible to accept in its entirety. Peter Buck stated that the idea of EO in the Maori was a late concept in the 1800s as a reaction to Christianity. This presentation of the EO tradition was soon rejected by scholars. Sir Peter Buck wrote that the discovery of a supreme god named EO in New Zealand was a surprise to Maori and Pakake alike. Abraham Fornander and Peter Buck are some of the most quoted sources in Kikawa's book, Perpetuated in Righteousness. Again, Peter Buck, whom Kikawa quotes to support his theory, states, he and other scholars were suspicious of the fact that both T. Madahanga and his scribe T. Wadahoro had become Christians before the details of the Eo cult were written down. Buck himself concluded that no authentic proof existed for the concept of a supreme creator named Eo, Keo, Kaiho in the Eastern Polynesia before the dispersal to the various island groups took place. Eric Schwimmer in the book World of the Maori says, Mata Rohanga felt complete, uh, freely admits that he did not transmit traditions in their pure form, but that much of the knowledge is lost and that he made changes and innovations. Buck writes from the conversion of the missionaries' work, the later Hawaiian historians, influenced no doubt by their acceptance of Christian teaching, grew Kani Kuhulono into a trinity. Kikawa says this is what they always worshipped and had this special knowledge of God. Peter Best in the Maori religion and mythology says, nor is there any resemblance between the Eo of the Maori myth and the somewhat truculent Jehovah of the Old Testament. Now the word truculent means defiant. In other words, he's saying there's no correlation between these two gods. He's not the same God. Now Kikawa refers to Handy at least seven times in his book, <laughs> yet Handy says the very opposite of what Kikawa is writing. 
He wrote the Polynesian religion and Hawaii cult of Io invest and investigated Mata Haranga's account of the name Io in some of the Hawaiian charts, and he found the name Io was applied to the Hawaiian hawk because it cries with the sound Io Io. And he cautioned that proof was lacking that this reference to Io in Hawaii was a supreme being. But Kukau, who's not anywhere near a scholar like these men, says he has proof. In his book, The Coming of the Maori, Buck explains Kanaloa was part of the original four, not three, and was subtracted so there would be three. And he writes, Eo of New Zealand, nor Tooroa of Tahiti, had a father and mother, so they had to create themselves but by, by what some might be termed auto-deification. It was an easy matter for them to create or conjure forth other gods. I can go on and on giving you numerous quotes, there are so many, that prove that what he has lifted out and put in his book is not accurate at all. Um, many of the quotes actually say that Connie was a greater god than the others, they were inferior to him. So we do not have in a quality of the Godhead like the Bible describes. Yet he says, this is Christian teaching before the missionaries came to Hawaii. He even goes on and says another interesting fact is that the father of the gods of the Egyptians was Nu, which is almost identical to the Polynesian Noah, Nu'u. Nu and Nut, the female form of Nu, were the progenitors of the gods and founders of the Egyptian civilization. Nu and Nut were two of the original eight gods of the Egyptians. So now we have Noah as a god, one of the original gods of Egypt, even though um, Egypt had 70 main gods, not just eight. And in ancient Egyptian mythology, the beginning of time began with Nu, New is the description of what the planet was before land appeared. New was a vast area of swirling, watery chaos, and as the floods receded, the land appeared. And the first god appeared out of this water mass, which was Atom, who emerged from New as the sun god, and he is the creator of the world. So not only does he mix up Christianity, but he also mixes up these other religions as well. Kukawa is stretching things to correlate a myth to scripture and makes the scripture a myth. So who are we to believe? What God has said or what Kukawa is saying in his book? Now, after 10 years, this book's influence has spread and is now responsible for being a catalyst in what is called the indigenous people movement that is currently being promoted by missionary organizations and people like Richard Twist and Wyland. His book is endorsed by John Dawson, who is the president of YWAM. In fact, John Dawson is on his board, on the Aloha Keakua board, and he fully endorses this myth mythology presented in his book. And because of this, this false history is now being taught through the missionary organization of YWAM to many of the youth, which I think is just a travesty. John Dawson of YWAM said, with his approval about Kukawa's book, Marvelous. This is what we need for every people group. If only they had the clear picture of the Lord's redemptive destiny that the Hawaiians now possess. Daniel Kukawa and the Hawaiians are showing us the way. The way to what? Kukawa has now carried his concept of Io, of the Hawaiian people being the true God, the same God as Israel, to an extreme. He now applies it to numerous gods in the nations, which shows me how far removed he is from a biblical world view. He now has Hananim of Korea, Allah, Shang-Ti of the Chinese. He's claiming that these are all the supreme God and everybody worship this, these gods as the true God. This gospel of inclusivism has no limits. It can be made to fit anyone or anything. And it has nothing to do with the gospel delivered in the Bible. And it should be apparent. This indigenous people movement is, uh, is inclusive to other religions and cultures, and it's misleading people from the pure gospel. 
Now this is exactly what the other religions of the world have been teaching all along, that we all worship the same God just by different names. There's no difference. And this is what the World Council of Churches, that's a liberal organization, and that's what their message is as well. This fits well into a generic one world creator, a God of all names, that promotes interfaith and cooperation in all. Truly, they are not preaching the God of all nations, but all the nation's gods. Now on the Aloha Keakua website, he says our goal is to provide indigenous people, missionaries and Christians with information, training materials that show the true nature of Jesus, that his way is not to be a farm religion that deserve, destroys people's groups and cultures, but one that brings people groups and their cultures to their highest fulfillment. Sounds very noble. His message and method is clearly explained in his book, Perpetuating Righteousness, where it says, instead of destroying and ridiculing the native names of the Creator God, we should help preserve them as a legacy for these peoples. Christians should cease representing Jesus as the son of the foreign God of a foreign people. We should instead introduce Jesus as the son of their Creator God. And let me repeat this, and you think about this. We should instead introduce Jesus as the son of their creator, God. That changes a lot of things. Premise, the creator God of the Bible is not a foreign God of these nations, and that their God sent a son. That their God was involved in forming their culture from the beginning. Now, the way I see this, it's either what's called sophism, a deliberately invalid argument displaying ingenuity in reasoning in the hope of deceiving somebody, or a paralogism, which is just a plain invalid argument. I see no other answer to this. Now, we see this as a serious threat to both the gospel and evangelism. To accept this new way to introduce people to other cultures and nations will actually reverse all the missionary efforts that were done in the past. It changes the nature of God and is working throughout history and even the gospel itself. Because not one no longer keeps it connected through the nation Israel, but is completely severed from its origin. It diminishes, if not annihilates, the deity of the Son. The Old Testament history of the prophets is marginalized or even ignored. The New Testament is also diminished because many of these cultures that Kakawa references were developed during the history of the church with the completed revelation that was already given to us in the New Testament. This becomes ignored. Now recently on a radio program called Word <clears throat> to the World, Danny Lehman of YWAM interviewed Daniel Kikawa. And he, addressing the problem of evangelism in these cultures, he says, Well, we found two main problems. And one again is, he's not our God, he's a foreign God. So we find, again, the, the native name, if Romans 1.20 is true, they would have a name for, for the Creator God, even if it's a remnant left, you know, because they're at the state after Romans 1.20. Even if it's 120. twisted or perverted or whatever, they still have a name for God. Right, that we can purify again instead of turning over to Satan, saying, you dirty the name of God, we'll throw it away. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a precious legacy for them that says God loves you. Can we purify a name of a false God? A God who formerly misled the people into corruption and bondage? It is a name of another God who has a false belief system attached to him. It's not the same God of the Bible. Well, what's in a name? Well, quite a lot. Every name of God in the Bible reveals something of his character, something of his nature. Names express God's attributes and abilities. In the nations, these names are God's that they built idols to. Each culture worshiped and prayed to their creator God, and Kikawa calls them God, the real God. But each name represents something behind it. There are personalities behind these gods. It's not whether a culture attributes that their God made heaven and earth, but did he actually do so? The true God says in Jeremiah 10, verse 11, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. God is certainly referring to the gods of the nations. It does not seem that Kakao believes that there are any false gods. 
These other cultures never had a revelation that God gave to Israel, yet he says they had accurate information and worship God correctly. Now, throughout history, we have rare individuals like Mechizedek, the priest of the Most High God, who blessed Abraham. But this does not mean that all the Canaanites knew the Most High God. We also have a record of Job in the Abrahamic period. He obeyed God and had a personal encounter with God. But history does not prove that whole cultures and people worship God correctly, only scarce individuals. Until God took Abraham and formed the nation of Israel to receive his revelation. And Romans 3.2 says that Israel, to them, was committed the oracles of God. No other nation was given these commands and these ways to live. Yakawa, speaking of the Korean culture, says, But when the Protestant missionaries came in decades later and, and used the name of Hananim, all of a sudden there was great excitement that our God sent his son for us, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not a foreign God anymore, our God. And the emphasis is that it's a God that they already know, one that they've already been worshiping. Again, his message and method is explained in his book, Christians should cease representing Jesus as the son of the foreign God, of a foreign people. We should instead introduce Jesus as the son of their creator God. Clearly this is false because God is foreign to everyone until they know him. What if you were to introduce Yahweh as another God in Moses' time? Well, it'd be considered blasphemy and the most serious of offenses. If you look at Deuteronomy 13, it says that if a prophet or one who has dreams spoke in order to turn you away from the Lord your God, it goes on in verse 6, if anyone secretly entices you saying, let us go and serve other gods which you have not known. Or Deuteronomy 18, about a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods. It says that prophet shall die. Now, of course, we don't kill, kill people today, but we certainly do not listen to them or buy their books. Now, I see a direct correlation of what Yukau is doing to what Moses was happened with Moses when he was up on the mount receiving the commandments from the Lord at Mount Sinai. Under pressure from the people, Aaron was below, and they asked him to build an idol in the shape of one of the gods from Egypt. So out came a calf. And he assigns this golden calf as their deliverer, calls him God, Elohim, that led the Israelites out of Egypt. In Exodus it says, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And they celebrated, and they danced, and they rejoiced about this visible representation of their God, attributing to him all that was done. Now this idol was not God, but was accepted as God for the sake of the people. They compromised. Now, same thing. Yukau was saying, your God, that you've worshipped for millennia, had a son. Don't tell him it's a foreign God. Tell him it's your God. Kawa says, why people in China and Japan do not accept the gospel? One of the main reasons, be because this is not their God. Now he's a foreign God come here and uh, it, not using that native name. And this is one of the main things that we have found too with the Hawaiian people. And he goes on and talks about the worship and the hula and says, He just dwells within the praises of his people and the anointing of God is there when these dances are used to worship God. And it immediately tells to the Hawaiian people, he's Hawaiian who loves the Hawaiian people. Well, certainly God does love the Hawaiian people. But is God Hawaiian? I seem to have missed that in the Bible. But not to worry because he says God is also Japanese, Chinese, Korean, and Islamic. He's the God of all these cultures. He seems to neglect that God who became man was Jewish and was sent to his own people Israel. And he is called the Lord God of the Hebrews, the God of Israel over 200 times. The God of Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God and Father of Israel. And it even says in the Bible, what other nation on earth is called by my name, Israel my glory. And of course, it does say in Romans that he is the God of both the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, this kind of evangelism diminishes the importance of Israel as God's people. Again, Romans 3 says, to them were committed the oracles of God. This is why God made Israel.
Israel theocracy and gave them the true record that through these people the whole world would be blessed because the Messiah came through their lineage. Psalm 81.8 says, Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you, O Israel, if you will listen to me. There shall be no foreign god among you, nor shall you worship any foreign god. That's good advice from God, even for the church. The Bible happens to be a Jewish book beginning with Moses who collected the genealogies and wrote for us the account of creation detailed to him by God who was on Mount Sinai. I can only wonder how one teaches the history in the Old Testament if you're teaching these people that their God, or gods, their history is accurate. If their God did not teach Judaism, how can their God be God? When you completely disconnect the son from his heritage, Israel, then you have a different son of God. You can't just attach Jesus to any God or religious system and Christianize him as Kakao is doing. He is promoting what is called syncretism, and it destroys the gospel and the nature of God. And at all costs, we need to avoid blending religious and spiritual elements of ancient native beliefs and practices with the Christian faith. Otherwise, we will end up with another Jesus and another gospel. Our God says no other nation can be compared to Israel, and he gave them their, his instructions. Now, Kikawa says he was born in the center of civilization of that day, you know, the nexus of Europe and Asia and Africa, the civilization of that day. And what did Jesus say is tell everybody that I came. You know, not that you don't know God and you don't have no relationship with him and he's a foreign God to you, but that, that um, the son of your creator came who made himself known to you, as, as Romans 1.20 says. Well, the center of civilization back then was actually Rome. Of course, to admit that the Jewishness of Jesus would be contrary to his presentation of the son of their gods, Romans 1.20 is continually repeated as proof, even though it does not say the son of your creator. Paul did not say that your creator had a son when he went out to evangelize in Asia. He did not say to the Greeks, Zeus had a son, or Uranus, the supreme god of the Greeks, had a son, and that's Jesus Christ. What Kikawa is doing is cross-cultural syncretism with other gods, not cross-cultural evangelism. This is not a way to evangelize them. And it is the very thing that God warned us not to do. This is training our salt for sugar to attract people that are turned off by the narrow truth of the gospel and the name that it exalts. Now how dangerous is this syncretism to say that their God or God's has a son when the Bible speaks directly against this? It's near blasphemy. Telling people their God's son is Jesus Christ removes him from his own people, Israel. It disconnects him from the prophecies in the Old Testament the shadows, the types given to Israel, most important of all, it has him lose his Jewish identity born through Mary. This is a new type of replacement theology calling the nation's gods, God. And it's become an alternative religion that the Cowboys made up, lock, stock, and barrel. Now on a discernment website, it says this, on this blog, Orality, O-R-A-L-I-T-Y, is connected with the New Apostolic Reformation heresy of contextualization. Orality permits the Word of God to be contextualized to a pagan culture through images, icons, symbols, thereby retaining the pagan elements of that culture. Using redemptive analogies, these pagan beliefs and practices are claimed to be redeemable and Christianized. Even the name of God is being changed to that of pagan deities. And that is exactly what Kikawa is doing. And this is where most of it is coming from. Right here, these islands going out to the world. Teaching that God has been shaping these cultures and societies through their history is a blatant false statement. This theory about, is about as sound as the theory of evolution. We know the names of the supreme gods of these cultures had what they had and what they were like. These gods came with historical spiritual baggage that can't be separated from their past history. The acceptance of these cultures, myths, and gods implies that the God of the Bible is only a better myth, 
not the absolute truth given by God who loves the people of the world. And let me just end with this. In the uh, world, Word to the World interview, Pucala says that the evangelist message did not contain to tell everybody that I came that you don't know God or you don't have a relationship with Him, that He's a foreign God which is patently false. Galatians 4.8 says, But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those by which by nature are not gods. And Paul commended the Gentiles, saying, You have turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Paul tells the church not to live like the Gentiles who do not know God. And on this one scripture alone, it proves everything that Kakao is saying is wrong. Ephesians 2.11, speaking of the Gentiles, at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. So Paul writes, without God. This is the same Paul who writes in Romans 1 that Kakao continually quotes to try to prove that everybody wants new God. And actually, in 1 Corinthians 1.21, it says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And that is what we are to preach, Christ crucified. So why go back in time and, have, and find remnants, corrupted versions, of God in all these different cultures when we already have the complete revelation of the Bible in our hands. Why use distortions and fragments contained in myths? Because as Kakawa puts it, Jesus becomes a foreign God to them and they won't accept Him. Well, the Bible says otherwise. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinding, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Every culture worships and prays to their creator God. The Calic says, that's God. But each one represents something behind it. And there are personalities behind these names. And again, it doesn't seem like Ikawa has any view that these could be false. In Deuteronomy 4.39, the Lord himself is God in heaven above and earth beneath. There is no other. Deuteronomy 5.7 says, You shall have no other gods before me. Obviously, God did not think that these supreme gods of these other nations were him. And he says in Deuteronomy 6.14, You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are all around you. Every time Israel did, God punished them severely. Joshua 23, verse 7 says, You shall not make mention even of the names of these other gods. Why? Because they're false gods and they can influence you. To use the names of ancient gods for worship is forbidden by the true God, but to say to these gods they are the true God, to me, is like blasphemy. And as Paul said to the Galatians, and I think we should do the same, we should not yield submission even for one hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with us. No one should be paying attention to this kind of teaching that's coming through this book and through this man. And with that, I'll end. Thank you. What I want to address tonight is basically 11 reasons to reject the teachings of the indigenous peoples movement, or it's also called the First Nations movement. And I'll just call it IPM tonight because if I have to say that indigenous peoples movement over and over again, I think I probably will not be able to go on. But I wanted to kind of try to give you uh, an overview. Mike is giving you some real specific information, especially about uh, a man from this island who's very much uh, uh, promoting these ideas. 
and his, his book is probably one of the fine books behind it. But I want to give you sort of an overview because there are others involved and hopefully give you some things that you can help others with, some pointers. Now the indigenous people uh, here after IPM, or the First Nations movement, that's what they wanted to call it actually, is an unbiblical movement teaching heresies and frankly doctrines of demons. And I'll show you why. It's being spread worldwide by Youth with a Mission, Don Richardson, Don, uh, John Dawson of YWAM, Richard Twist of Wichoni International, uh, Terry LeBlanc of World Vision Canada, Yan Kikau of Loa Keakua, Danny Lehman of YWAM, and many, many other adherents. Now, the IPM is full of the false teachings of movements such as the Third Wave, the New Apostolic Reformation, we've talked about some of these before, uh, Word Faith, uh, Dominionism, Latter Rain, and many other false theological systems and teachings. But it does have its own distinctives. And these are driven by the works, uh, in particular, of Danny Kukawa, Richard Twist, and Don Richardson, uh, in particular. Now, they're teaching Christians to, quote unquote, redeem their cultures by worshiping their former gods, pretending that they are YHWH. But when Jesus Christ was first introduced to the islands, you know what? He was introduced as the biblical Jesus Christ, the son of David, born a Jew, the second person of the triunity of God. Jesus was not introduced as Pele, or Io of Hawaii, or Tangaloa of the Marshalls, or Nan Sapwe of Ponte, or Wanafa of Juk, or uh, Uenyan uh, of Palau, or Yalafa of Ya, or Puntan of Fuuna of Guam, or any other mythological or demonic gods of those areas. To call Jesus by these other names is to blaspheme his name. Philippians 2, 9 through 10. Also, there is salvation in only one name under him, and that is the name of Jesus Christ, Acts 4 to 12. We are to worship God by His name, not in other names. Now, 27 times in the New Testament, it declares that we are to follow God in the name of Jesus Christ. And these are some of the references. And you can ask me for them later, or look, look up on my website. The Gospel came to the islands through missionaries from Hawaii, and advanced through Micronesia, for instance, one island group at a time, and then they sent missionaries to the next group. They brought the true gospel of the Jewish Savior, Jesus Christ, God's only Son, who died on a cross in Jerusalem for the sins of the world. What IPM teachers are doing is promoting culture at the expense of truth. Now, I stand against this influx of IPM unbiblical ideas, and I do so because of the ongoing ministry of my family. For 44 years, alongside the churches of the islands, in Micronesia in particular, in furtherance, furtherance of the gospel. You know what? We love the island people. And that shows by the fact that we've given our lives to come here and serve. But for the IBM to teach what their, their teaching constitutes an all out attack on mission and church work in the islands. Now, I. If you want to read up on this, please come to my website uh, for a full article on this. Uh, it's, uh, and the website is, is up there for you to see. So here are 11 reasons that I've come up with, and there are many more, but in, in particular to reject the IPM movement. IPM leaders teach that God has been redeeming cultures, and that he placed in all cultures a way for men to have a relationship with God outside of the gospel. Now this is what Leon Sue had to say. So mm -hmm. these are, are clues that we felt God had left and evidence that he had left as well as processes he had left in which our Hawaiian people can respond in their natural way to God and, and really set things right between them and God. Then also we have uh, Terry LeBlanc. Uh, there's a myth that we have labored under for for centuries in indigenous communities and the myth is that we were a godless heathen people 
uh, God is now calling forth from among the indigenous communities of the world that good deposit which he has made in them of their cultures, their languages, their musical expressions, and all of that sort of thing, which has previously not been brought forth, and he's asking for it as an expression of praise and worship unto himself. So let's address the two false assumptions in what you just heard. Number one, that God is in the business of redeeming cultures, and that two, that God placed in cultures uh, a way of redemption apart from the gospel message. Now first of all, the only culture that will be redeemed will be that of God's chosen people, the Jews. Psalms 138. During the tribulation, Zechariah 13.1. But this will be because a certain percentage of the Jews, those who have survived, uh, and that's in Revelation, will come to understand and believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, John 3.3. 3. Other than this example, there's nowhere in the Bible where it talks about God redeeming cultures. Revelation 7.9 speaks of nations, tribes, peoples, and languages standing before the throne of God, but not cultures. This verse is talking about individuals who have believed in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord from all the nations of the earth. That's what it's talking about. Cultures, though, are the traditions of men. Mark 7, 8 through 9, 13, and Colossians 2, 8. They're not God-created, as many of the IPM people claim. God is in the business of redeeming individuals from sin. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 23, Galatians 3, 14. Not cultures. The idea of redemption or quote-unquote transformation, we've heard a lot about that lately here in Hawaii, of whole cities, societies, cultures, is actually a dominionist idea from people like John Dawson of YWAM, and also the latter reign in the New Apostolic Reformation. And it has no basis in Scripture whatsoever. Each man must believe for himself. Acts 16.31, Romans 10.9. Upon conviction of the Holy Spirit, John 16.8-9. Notice that though the Holy Spirit is sent into the world to convict of sin, He's convicting men who do not believe in Jesus Christ, not whole cultures. Second, there is no way for man to come to believe in Jesus Christ without having heard the gospel, Ephesians 1.13. You cannot hear the gospel without it being preached to you, Romans 10.14-15. And the Gentiles had no knowledge of the gospel until that mystery, it was a mystery, was revealed to them by way of the apostles and missionaries. Ephesians 2, 12. Case closed as far as I'm concerned. The second point to reject. IPM leaders teach that gods being worshipped in cultures were really the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and deities are renamed accordingly. Arnold Fruchtenbaum comments on Kikawa's perpetuated righteousness. He says that Hawaiians already were worshipping, uh, uh, Kikawa claims that Hawaiians were already worshipping God in the bird form, and the, the bird god Io long before uh, missionaries arrived, and that's the true God. In fact, just recently, he got up in front of a biblical church here and prayed to Io from the pulpit. Very sad business. He also claimed that the Polynesian people were descended from Israel. Like I said before, I think it's time to do, to do a DNA test. The Mormons made the same claim for the for the Indians, American Indians, and they were proven wrong through DNA. So it's a simple thing to do. Not only do native do the ancestors of Native Americans not come from Israel, but we know where they in fact came from, and that's from the northern part of East Asia. The people that we can identify today as Native Americans, the, the people that we can pull DNA from, uh, their uh, genetic markers are more close, closely related to, to people from Siberia. The, the evidence acceptable to most archaeologists and physical anthropologists, both from dental traits and from mitochondrial DNA, is that the origin of people in North, Central, and South America before the coming of the Europeans in 1492 was North Asia. I really don't think there's any connection between Middle Eastern people and Hawaiians, I'm sad to say. I don't think it's even possible. 
He also says they can trace their genealogies back to Noah. <laughs> I don't think so. And that they knew the gospel because it was written in the stars. Mike dealt with that before. Richard Twiss was involved in an IPM conference where they prayed the following opening invocation. May the Father, Adadoda, who is the creator, Adan Hila Husky, and his son Tzitza, bless you with perfect peace and favor by the power of the Holy Spirit, Yohewa. Daniel, uh, Danny Lehman argues that Christians can use the names of false, uh, foreign false gods if they simply redefine them as the Jewish God. Let's listen to him. And you have been under the gun on this issue of Eo in the Hawaiian culture. Well, that's a bird god and it's obviously a demon and so forth and you can't worship it. We're not saying that we need to worship a bird god and we're not saying we need to worship a moon god. But we're saying that those people understand it that way and they already have that as their god and perhaps we can use that name and teach the truth about the character of Jehovah God without going to an Arab Muslim and saying you have to accept the Jewish God. So that's where we're coming from. A number of problems with this statement. First of all, if Eo is a false demonic bird god in Hawaii, how can you change that to the real thing? Won't people forever be confused about who God really is if their concept of God is a mixture? Remember, God hates a mixture. The Bible's clear about that. From the beginning, from the very beginning of creation, He separated the light from the darkness. Think about it. God blesses those who trust in the Lord Jehovah and curses those who turn aside to false gods. Psalm 44. From the beginning, the nations had false gods, just like the Hawaiians have their false bird god, Eo, among a pantheon. Oh, there's a lot of gods here in Hawaii, of other gods, including many supreme being creator gods. Last time I counted, there were at least five. Those who follow the Lord God of Israel and His Son, Jesus Christ, walk in the name of the Lord. That's what the Bible says. Not the names of other false demonic gods. That's Micah 4, 5. Any prophet or Christian, for that matter, who speaks in the name of other gods, well, you know what? They were put to death in the Old Testament by Old Testament law. Deuteronomy 18, 20. Today, we are to rebuke false teachers and false prophets, marking them and avoiding them. So what are Danny Kukawa, Danny, Danny Lehman, and many other IPM Christians speaking today? They are speaking in the name of other gods. That's what Deuteronomy says. You know what? There's only one God. In three persons, as revealed to the prophets and apostles, and subsequently to those who believe in Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, God revealed himself to the Jews exclusively. And there was no salvation apart from the Jews. We have to remember that. It was one tree, not many trees. One tree and were grafted in. In the New Testament, God revealed himself through the apostles, and especially through Paul to the Gentiles. All the gods of the nations were and are false gods. And here's the, here are the verses. Even the supreme beings of the nations were not God. Some cases to look for, and there are many others, would be the case of Amun, or Amun of, of Egypt, who is their supreme being. Hadad uh, of the Arameans, remember? He was the god of the hills, and, but he wasn't the god of the valleys. Oops, not the supreme being. And yet he was their supreme being, you see. And Marduk of Babylon, and many other detestable gods. Look up those references, and they will show you that God is against the supreme beings of other nations. He is not those supreme beings. You know what? The Bible mentions many detestable gods. Detestable gods of the nations. And these are the many uh, scriptural references for that. So by teaching these ideas, the IPM is bringing people who have just come out of unbelief back into slavery to false gods. 2 Peter 2, 18-21. And teaching things they ought not to teach. Titus 1, 9-14. As those in Paul's day were spreading Jewish myths, today the IPM is spreading Gentile myths instead of the true gospel. Alright, point number three. 
IPM leaders teach the spiritual warfare techniques of John Dawson, C. Peter Wagner, and other third waivers to rid cities and nations, allegedly, of demonic influence. Then people will just find themselves wanting to get saved. Um, we have Richard Twist saying this, that he was, they were going to pray for 12 hours simply for the heart, Father's heart to be released for the healing of the land and spiritual renewal. And they wanted to repent for the sins of their fathers, uh, unforgiveness, uh, judgment, and bitterness, pray for the release of ancient curses, and pray a blessing over the land as the host nations. This was in a smoke signals uh, newsletter. This shows the kind of, this is the same kind of rhetoric used by the spiritual warfare movement. Also, we have him saying that uh, there will be uh, traditional new, uh, uh, First Nation style drumming and dance as part of worship time, geared toward a prophetic impartation of release and liberty in Christ. I just don't remember when drumming was used for that, but anyway, this, this will be a time to see the release of the one new person made possible in Christ between the host people of the land and the later immigrant people of North America. So you see these spiritual warfare techniques running through this whole movement. These pra pragmatic techniques and practices will not liberate anyone, though. The spiritual warfare movement is based on a false understanding of Matthew 16, 19. They claim they can bind and loose demons, not only in individuals, but over whole regions and nations. But this is a perfect example of the absolute necessity of context, context, context when you're studying the scripture. Always remember that. Context. Very important. Let's look at Matthew 16, 17 through 20. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. By the way, Jesus Christ is the rock. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Now the context is one of establishing the church and preaching the gospel and has nothing to do with casting out of demons or casting down territorial spirits. Just read the whole passage. There's nothing in there. Notice that the, that, that the time had not yet come to proclaim Jesus, Christ was the, uh, Jesus was the Christ. But the time would come when that mystery would be revealed, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles, Galatians 2, 7 through 9. This is also the context in which Matthew 18, 18 must be understood, where they are addressing church discipline, Matthew 18, 15 through 20. The context is one of establishing and maintaining the church. That's the context, not one of spiritual warfare. Unless by spiritual warfare we're talking about confronting sin and preaching the gospel, telling people they're sinners. Yeah, that's spiritual warfare, yes. Now, if a person in the church sins and will not repent, then the leadership of the church has the authority to bind or loose that person. This all has to do with continued establishment of the church, which is in the hands of God-called leadership of this church. See, this is why it's so important to read the Bible correctly. Because otherwise you come to real false understanding of people put, take things out, binding and loosing. It has nothing to do with spiritual warfare as proposed by people like John Dawson and this movement. A larger question remains for the careful thinker. Why do this type of unbiblical spiritual warfare to rid towns, cities, cultures, and nations of demonic influence when you're getting people to go back to their old gods and worship them under the name of YHWH? It's like, it seems to me to be counterproductive. That's the kind of mixture that you have in this kind of a movement. So this is the case where two wrongs don't make a right, and in fact, they make a mess. Let's look at number four. IPM leaders teach that God can be worshiped using cultural methods heretofore used to worship other gods. Richard Twist travels all over the world teaching people to dance their prayers. I, I get his newsletter and he says they're going to be, they were going to be Dancing Our Prayers of Switzerland tour. And then we have Dancing Our Prayers Peruvian tour. He's going all over the world doing this. I'm not exactly sure what Dancing Your Prayers does. I thought we were supposed to pray with our mind. 
and pray with understanding. Isn't that what prayer is about? I believe it is. You've got to be careful about that kind of stuff. He also says, uh, I'm excited about my trip to dance with Jonathan Miracle at an international music festival in Cairo, Egypt. A special stage is being erected near the Great Pyramids. Um, and as we go in the grace, beauty, and anointing of our cultural identity as First Nations represent, representation of Christ and the Kingdom, um, uh, please pray for grace, protection, and peace for our kingdom. He also says this, that uh, his good friend uh, invited him to dance in their powwow. After years of being invited to church uh, meetings and witness to the powwow was the first Christian event the chief ever agreed to attend. Well, of course. Because it's not a Christian event, it's a powwow. I want to give you some information about what a powwow is from the Webster's Dictionary. It says this. First of all, a powwow is an American Indian medicine man. That's the first definition. Um, and many others. The next explanation of actual, uh, as actual meaning is, of the word is much clearer. It says, because trances were so important to the Native American shaman as a means of getting in touch with spiritual forces beyond the kin of the normal person, the title powwow, literally meaning one who has visions, was accorded him. Does this have anything to do with true Christianity? No, it has to do with Indian religion. The Bible is clear that we don't dance our prayers or enter altered states to pray. That's what the heathens have done with their false gods who have no knowledge of what God requires. Born again Christians are to pray with their minds. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. Not in altered states. 1 Corinthians 14, 14. If you want to read about this, read Corinthians. This is where he addresses these things. We are to remain alert when we're praying in the Spirit. Ephesians 6, 18. We may lift up holy hands in prayer, meaning we worship God in our praying, 1 Timothy 2 8. But prayer is a way to worship God, Acts 13 1 3. Thank Him and present our petitions to God, Hebrews 12 28 and 1 Timothy 2 1. Being devoted to prayer in watchfulness and thanksgiving, Colossians 4 2. Not in partying in a party atmosphere, Romans 13 13 14. I think it's pretty clear how we are to pray. We all used to be pagans, let's face it. All of us. I was probably one of the worst. But now, those of us who are born again are children of God in Jesus Christ, not given to debauchery again. First Peter 4.3 There's nowhere in the Bible where dances were used for prayer. Now, dances were used to praise and worship God, such as in the case of David. Okay? 2 Samuel 6.14 He was praising the Lord for bringing them back into uh, the city of David with, with the ark. But we, we do not pray with dances. Prayer is an act of communication with God using our minds. That's the Christian concept. Okay? Those other kinds of concepts come from the world. We are not to adopt worldly methods. We are to use what the Bible teaches us to do with regards to prayer. And you can see it being used to worship Pele, the volcano god, and everything, and you can sense the presence of that god there when the anointing of God is there, when these dances are used to worship God. And it immediately tells to the Hawaiian people, he's Hawaiian who loves the Hawaiian people. And, you know, we, we need to understand, you know, in Acts, again, it does not prohibit the, the native dances and so on. Now, we need to take what Satan has stolen back and put it where it, it, God created it sure. for, which is to worship Him. Sure. And to use the same logic, nobody would tell somebody, if you used to use your house for a crack house and you get saved, you need to burn That's your house right. down. Or you have a, you know, a smokehouse among the, uh, what do they call those houses that the Native Americans? Yeah, the, the um, uh, sweat lodge. Sweat lodge, you know, where they, they may smoke a pipe or something in there or, or whatever, you know. And, and we have all these non-believing or non-Christian cultural taboos. First of all, God did not create the hula. Sorry to say. Sorry to let you down on that one. He didn't create a number of dances that we have in the world. Now, there are a number of false assumptions in this teaching. Number one, if Kakawa says that he can feel the anointing when the hula dance is done for Pele, what distinguishes that anointing from the one when the hula is used to worship YHWH? 
I find this to be a big problem. You see, a lot of people talk about the anointing today. They don't even know what the anointing is. They think the anointing is feeling good. Like I said before, there's the Holy Spirit and there's the Zeitgeist. The Zeitgeist can, can cause you to have all kinds of ecstatic feelings. Oh, that's an anointing. No, it's not. The fact is, is that the idea of feeling an anointing and knowing it is from God is subjective and no proof of the activity of the Holy Spirit at all. God is the one who gives the anointing. 2 Corinthians 1, 21-22. There's only one anointing, 1 John 2.20, and that's the anointing of the anointed one, who is Jesus Christ. Uh, Psalm 2.2, 2, Acts 4.2, and he's Jesus Christ, King of Kings. When a person is born again, they are anointed by the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 1, 21-22, Ephesians 1, 13. They are foreknown, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. Romans 8, 29-30. Also, we know from the Bible that no one should try to transfer the Holy Spirit to another person, as the anointing is the person of the Holy Spirit. Luke 4, 18, Titus 3, 5. The anointing is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and he gives us various gifts. We know that. 1 Corinthians 12, 4. So that we can minister to the church and preach the gospel to the world. God is not in the business of giving out free massages, thrill rides, ecstatic experiences, and he does not want uh, people to play around with it. You know, act like or think that they have some kind of higher revelation of the supernatural going around claiming there's an anointing or assigning anointings to things that he has not assigned them to. That's the problem we have today in the churches. Oh, there's an anointing on that book. There's an anointing on that wall. The anointing is people. Okay? I I'm sorry. That's just wrong. Wrong theology. God expects us to act in an orderly fashion in the congregation of the saints. This is the key. 1 Corinthians 14.33 Now I'm sorry if this is offensive to modern Hawaiians, but the older islanders, you know what happened when the missionaries came? They rejected the hula in churches for the very reason that it caused men to lust and was a dance that it was dedicated to foreign gods. This is a fact of history. You can't change that. And you know what? It wasn't the missionaries making them. It was them going, we want to get out. Please. We need a way out. Freedom in Christ. All Kakao would, ha would have to do is read the historical accounts of mission work in Hawaii, which I have done, both by islanders and western missionaries to comprehend that what he's promoting is an affront to his own culture as a Christian. You know, I know that it's become an accepted practices in the churches in Hawaii, but I really don't think it's right. They need to do something about it. They need to change some things about it to make it come in line with scripture. We always have to do that. All of us have to do that. We have to edit in our lives to make sure we're not going back to the world. I'm not coming out against dance in general. I'm just saying we have to be real careful when something's been dedicated to a false god and then trying to use that in the church. <clears throat> it's not right. Number two, he says God is a Hawaiian god. Oh, really? No. Actually, God is God. God is God. He's the great I Am. He doesn't view different people groups or different people with partiality. It's very clear. Deuteronomy 10, 17, Acts 10, uh, 34. Apparently, Kikawa and his friends do view people with partiality. God doesn't. Number three, that Acts does not prohibit dancing is an argument from silence. You see, you've got to be careful about arguing from silence. When the Bible doesn't say something, then you're making an argument out of it. Well, the Bible doesn't talk about microwaves either. But we can't use them. The Bible, uh, doesn't, uh, for instance, doesn't uh, prohibit transsexuality. They didn't have such a thing back then. They didn't have operations like that. But you know what? It's wrong. It goes against God's principles, against the nature of God. 
Does that make it okay for Christians? No, it doesn't. We have to apply this to every situation, don't we? This is our, our manual, not our cultures, not what people want, not what people feel. It's what God wants, and it's written in His holy word. Number four, uh, Satan did not steal the hula. The hula was invented by people to worship Pele and other false Hawaiian satanic gods. Now, they often quote Titus Cohen, who was a great evangelist here in Hawaii, one of the early missionaries of Hawaii, probably the greatest evangelist of his time to the Hawaiian Islands. Thousands of people were saved. It's an amazing story. Here's what he said about the hula in regard to Polynesian cultures, which covers Hawaiian cultures. He said this, the hula or dance the, actress under, undergo, the actresses undergo long previous training during which time their persons are sacred to the gods. People were dedicated to the foreign, to the false gods when they were doing the hula. Well, what else? Titus Cohen has other things to say in his books as well. It's quite illuminating. Read his book and also the book by uh, about Ovokuhaya. Very, very important books, because they were there. They were eyewitnesses, by the way. Here's what he says about other activities that the, uh, that the Hawaiian gods required. On the coast of Kawihar, I have seen and measured the last great heiau of heathen temple of the renowned Kamehameha I, where human sacrifices were offered to the gods that cannot save or destroy I have also visited other heathen temples in Kona, Una, Hilo, on Molokai, and in other places. Many cultures were doing sacrifice and sacrifice. That is not from God, okay? That's what it means to be a pagan culture. And you know what? Many cultures in biblical times were utterly destroyed because they were sacrificing their sons and daughters to Molech, etc. So the hula is a dance dedicated to false gods. Unfortunately, the movements of the lower parts of the female body in this dance contain sexual messages to island people and do not help them escape from sin, but rather give the enemy a foothold. I know this, because I grew up in Palau and the dances were very similar. There are messages in those things. Just like there are messages with the hands, there are messages with the lower part. Okay, since the strip tease is a, is a Western dance, if we follow uh, Kikawa's logic, we would be perfectly justified in doing it in church, as long as it's dedicated to God. The fact that Kikawa can feel an anointing from the hula for whatever reason it is performed should give you a clue as to how the hula affects our people. It has an effect. You cannot fully sanitize something that has been offered to false gods. That's the, that's the point. Very hard. You see, we're, we're to be salt and light. We are to, to stand apart. Different. How will the world tell if we're different? If we're doing the same things the world is doing. I'm sorry to be so whatever, old-fashioned. I'm actually not. You know, if you knew if you knew what I used to do, which was play hard rock, Christian hard rock, you know I'm not an old fogey. <laughs> but we've got to be careful about that stuff. We've got to be careful about all those things we do and not be promoting. He's promoting this worldwide. So this has become a big problem. Let me try to give a helpful suggestion of what could be done with the Hula. Number one, take out the religious references to the false gods of Hawaii like Yo and Pele. Number two, take out the suggestive movements the tourists and island males love so well. And number three, rename it something else. That might work. Then you might be able to do it. I have no problem with Christian dance. I've seen people do um, a type of hula dance where they're doing it with their hands without all the hip movements. And, you know, they're not calling it the hula, they're calling it something else. I don't have a problem with that. I do have a problem with saying it's the hula. Because that is, that is dedicated to a false god. Okay. Number five, the fifth point is, uh, no, this isn't to the fifth point, but it's the fifth part of this uh, 
this, what they were saying. Danny Lehman makes yet another of a long line of bad analogies by trying to equate the issue of using the hula with the use of a house. Now, of course, Christians can use houses formally used for drugs or pot smoking in the case of the Indians, but they do not continue to do drugs and smoke pot anymore. That's the point. They don't continue to do those things in the house. That's the point that Layman misses. You know what? Hula is not a house. Hula is a dance dedicated for centuries to false gods. To take that dance and make it a large part of the Hawaiian Christian experience is to deny the dreadful and shameful use of the hula in the past. Why not uplift other cultural activities not tied to the worship of the demonic? Isn't the idea to take, make a clean break from our past when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, Philippians 3, 7 through 9? If Paul considered the Jewish culture and its activities to be dumb, actually it's a worse word than that, in view of the cause of Christ, how much more should we as Gentiles consider our cultures double dumb? Think about it. That's really something to consider. We are made new creatures in Christ. We are to leave the old things behind and go on to the new. Put on the new man. But what Kikawa and Layman are promoting is a, a direct 180 degree opposite of what Paul believed, taught, and lived with regard to culture. He said, for me to live is Christ. That's our focus. Not culture, not pleasing man, not all these other things we used to do. Christ and his gospel message. That's the center. That's the whole reason to live. And to die, it's gain. To be with Christ. People have gotten off, gotten off what the message of the Bible is. Okay, now number five. Richard Twist says that Indian First Nations people worship the Great Spirit who is really the Holy Spirit. He said that uh, in Charisma Magazine, he said, Jesus Christ is the healer, Great Spirit, and chief shepherds of all tribes and nations. He also, I saw him on the 700 Club myself, talking with Gordon Robertson, Pat Robertson's son, and uh, he told Gordon that the great spirit of the Indians was the Holy Spirit, and Robertson heartily agreed with him. He said, we need to get this message out to all the Christians. Eagle's Wings is a ministry of a pastor and author, Randy Woolley, and his wife, Edith. He says, both, both Native Americans, their mission is to present the great spirit son, Jesus Christ, in his words, the Bible to Native Americans in culturally relevant ways. That's off the... Uh, Wichoni website, which is Richard Twist's website. He also uh, participated uh, in, uh, he often, you'll see him participating in these dances and all these uh, cultural type activities uh, to promote his agenda. Uh, and he wears, uh, he, he does it as a Native American in full headdress, uh, uh, an Indian war bonnet. And uh, uh, the Brian Call, Dave Hunt, has commented on this. He said uh, that wearing the eagle feathers has a pagan and anti-religious, uh, not a cultural meaning. Uh, the Indian actually identifies himself with or becomes the quality or principle of the being or thing which comes to him in a vision, whether it is a beast, bird, one of the elements, or really any aspect of creation. In order that this power may never leave him, he always carries with him some material form representing the animal or object from which he has received his power. In wearing the eagle feather war bonnet, the wearer actually becomes the eagle, which is to say he identifies himself, his real self, with uh, Wakantaka, uh, Wakantanka, the great spirit, which Wan Li Galeshka, the spotted uh, eagle, represents. So what he's doing is he's actually identifying himself with a bird again. We have another bird, the eagle, which is representative of the Holy Spirit somehow. It's pantheism, actually. This is pantheism mixed with animism. Wichoni endorses eagles' wings and claims the great spirit is, is Jesus' son. They say uh, that they're there to, rep to present the great spirit's son, Jesus Christ. And yet the historical facts are that the Great Spirit is pan pan pantheistic. Uh, 
on one website, it says this, the great, there's a great spirit who created the earth and who pervaded everything. This was a, a panentheist rather than a pantheist belief. Um, so they admit that, this is, that the great spirit is pantheistic or panentheistic. The Lakota concept of Wankan uh most frequently translated as the great spirit, illustrates pantheism well. That's from another website. So this is, uh, this is seen by many people. Uh, they, they understand that, that God is seen as a pantheistic God. In other words, he's part, he is his creation. You know, he's not, he didn't create something as a separate entity. He's, he's part of everything. That's how the Indians view this. So exactly how can the Holy Spirit be the Great Spirit? Note that Richard Twist is a Lakota Sioux Indian. Now, the fact is, is that the Great Spirit required human sacrifice, again, and suicide to lift sicknesses that he sent. For instance, I found a testimony by someone who said, um, all would die unless a sacrifice was made to the Great Spirit. And then finally she closed her eyes and jumped, and soon afterwards the sickness left her people. The Great Spirit required that they do that, that she commit suicide. On another site, it talked about, um, as I sat down, they worshipped Toya or the sun, which, which they claimed represented the Great Spirit. Um, and then uh, it goes on to talk about sacrifices, human sacrifices. He also says, but among some tribes north of the Rio Grande, human sacrifices did exist. Evidence uh, exists that the Pawnee uh, in what is now Nebraska occasionally sacrificed someone. The Iroquois are said to have occasionally sent a maiden or a white dog to the Great Spirit. The human sacrifice and human sacrifice and cannibalism are believed to exist among people. <laughs> I didn't know this until I read up on it. The Great Spirit also required blood rituals in Lakota Sioux, which is his tribe. Uh, they offered their own blood. Uh, through the offering of their own blood, they were able to achieve an ecstatic state, making a connection with the Great Spirit and giving back to the earth something that is truly of their body. You know what I was reminded of? It was Elijah on Mount Carmel. People cutting themselves. Well, if we just get into an ecstatic state, Baal will come and he will send fire. That's what pagans do, you see? That's a pagan, heathen practice. Required by a pagan, heathen God, who is actually a deep, demonic God. The Great Spirit is not the Holy Spirit, He is not the Father, He is not the Son, He is not the Spirit, He is a false God of the Indian people. And when they heard the Gospel, those who are truly saved were saved out of that. Out of that terrible bondage. You have to understand, the Hawaiian people, the Indians, were in terrible bondage. How quickly we forget. How quickly we forget this thing. Again, there's no way for men to come to believe in Jesus Christ without having heard the gospel, Ephesians 1.13. You cannot hear the gospel without being preached to you, Romans 10, 14 through 15. The Gentiles had no knowledge of the gospel message until that mystery was revealed to them by way of the apostles and missionaries, Ephesians 2.12. So what Twiss, Kakawa, and others are doing is to teach two-thirds world Christians to make up fables about their formal religions uh, and about their formal religious practices, not based on the facts, but based on myths, unfortunately. And we read about myths in 2 Timothy 4, 3-4, and 1 Timothy 1, 3-4. You know, God's work among the Gentiles is a work of faith in Jesus Christ. Not faith in their former gods, who, uh, who they're now renaming to try to syncretize their heathen, pagan beliefs with Christianity.
Thank you.